Hi, everybody. Welcome to our very packed webinar today, uh, hosted by Suplino. I'm Michelle Peters um, at Suplino. We're running this live and recording. So you'll be able to share this with colleagues and uh, associates once we have it recorded and finished, and we'll post that link on our YouTube channel for you. Um, we have some great info today, talking to Andrew Wilson about the new normal of uh, supply chain in China with all the changes in the regulatory landscape and everyone talking about nearshoring. Mexico is now the number one trade partner of the United States, surpassing China for the first time in a long time. So it, it, things are not uh, as they were for the last couple of years. And Andrew's really gonna give us some insight into how we should navigate that for electronics and electromechanical product. Um, let me get started with a quick intro. I'm Michelle, this is a, <laughs> clearly my hair has changed since that picture, um, but I'm the CEO of Suplino and Suplino is a marketplace for uh, expert talent in manufacturing and supply chain. And Andrew is one of our uh, esteemed experts. Andrew, you wanna give a quick intro to everyone? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson. Uh, you know, I have lived and worked in China uh, on and off for 12 years. I uh, started working for uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's firm in Beijing, where I learned about Chinese business culture and you know really how to forge ties with Chinese stakeholders. Um, and you know, starting in really 2013, 2014, uh, I've been consulting startups and small, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, on their supply chain operations in China and helping companies raise over $350 million in venture capital um, as a result of the work that I've done with them. Oh, great and I'm to very have excited you. to be here. Talk to yeah. you. Excellent. All right, Liz, so let's get into this because I have like a, a, a ton of questions and it's a short um, it's a short session, but of the short session, you and I have already talked and we have five really good tips that you're sharing with people today. So we're gonna use this slide to go through those five tips as we talk through these different questions I have for you. So let's start with the regulatory landscape. I mentioned it in the intro. Um, what has really, what has changed? I'm, I'm calling this the new normal, but really what has changed and why has it impacted China specifically so dramatically? Yeah, certainly. You know, I, I think tensions were rising certainly before Trump initiated uh, tariffs and, and other tools against, um, you know, what he, they claim to be practices. But but I think what the catalyst was, many people would would agree, would be, you know, what what happened during COVID um, and the myriad of companies and industries impacted by the lockdowns in, in China. Um, yeah. And this was especially true when it came to, you know, personal protective equipment, PPE. Yeah. Um, used by hospital and first responders, um, you know, where I think what you saw was companies that were previously making diapers or cl or clothing were now all of a sudden making or claiming to make medical grade masks and gowns and other type of equipment, uh, knowing full well that many of the products uh, were substandard and didn't meet EU and FDA requirements, right? Um, and so, you know, as a result of, I think this, this practice, mm. um, you know, before what you would see is that the onus would be on the manufacturers to prove that they are, you know, producing things to the standards. And now the shift that has really taken place is that they're placing the onus on the buyers, the sellers, the distributors of these products in the markets themselves. Um, so, you know, you have new regulations such as the eco design and sustainable products regulation, uh, which has been around for quite some time, but was actually put into law in March of 2022. And mm -hmm. the U.S. is expected to follow suit with similar laws in the next year or two. And like I said, what, what this does is it really places the emphasis and burden on, you know, proof that these products meet these standards and certifications on the buyers, sellers, and distributors of these products um, in the countries that they're selling them to. Yeah, and the and the buyers are us, right? The the Western businesses that were expected, right? We can't just say, well, the factory told me they had the certification and I'm out, right? It it really changes our level of responsibility for for due diligence with these companies, right? Which I think is is let me share your first tip. Oh, I'm sorry. This is yeah, your second tip. I'm gonna just skip, we're gonna skip around then. 
your second tip is really ensure your own accountability, right? For um, yes, for buying uh, for buying products and for meeting the standards that you need to meet. I know the um, the EU has passed also the slave labor transparency uh, requirements. The U.S. is looking at that also, right? So there's a, all of a sudden there's a lot of hurdles to get over um, that before were kind of implied, but they weren't so explicit as they are now, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, again, previously it was a lot of the onus was on the manufacturers, and now because it's very difficult for regulators in the e in EU and US to go after those manufacturers, so they're going to go after the buyers and sellers and distributors of these products in the market, forcing them to be more diligent in um, you know the partners that they choose. Okay, and then then and what about the as a response to all of this, right, there's heavy pressure now on Chinese companies to, and, and there are excellent Chinese companies out there that have been compliant the entire time, right? This is not uh, to say that it's it's a, it's a broad brush that hits everyone, right? But it's always hard to know whether that particular factory is or isn't, right? If you're not checking it yourself, right? What, what has this pressure changed in China itself? Has the government and has industry changed and adjusted to new expectations and uh, regulatory expectations? Like I know, for example, IP has always been uh, a concern of companies going to China on how their IP is gonna be protected. Has, has it impacted that um, from your perspective? What do you think? Well, you know, I think, that from an IP perspective, we're just talking about that. And again, like I'm, like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on IP, but in my experience, there are very robust laws um, to protect IP inside of China, um, mm. including a network of courts. Um, and you know what I think has changed uh, over the last few years is that um, you know provincial enforcement um, has changed, right? So if your factory is down in Guangdong and you decide to take them to court for some kind of infraction on IP or other contra or some other aspect of your contract and you take them to court in Shanghai in years prior if the Shanghai court uh, ruled in your favor it would be very difficult to get that enforced in Guangdong or in Guangzhou or Shenzhen where your factory was um, but that has changed uh, now and I think that there's uh, you know a lot more uh, 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 you know there's a, a greater holistic approach to enforcement or rulings in Shanghai or Guangzhou and being enforced in other provinces. Um, so I think in addition, you know, there are many Chinese companies that are um, some of the largest, you know, filers of, of IP and patents mm -hmm. globally. Um, and so it really behooves the Chinese government to improve and make their IP protections more robust, not only protect Chinese companies um, in China, uh, but also to demonstrate to, you know, to Western companies that it's a safe invest environment to invest in, that you can yeah. innovate here and that your IP will be protected. Um, you know, that said, um, you know, there's a cultural difference between what is considered patented and protectable and what's not, right? So knowledge, things like manufacturing processes, um, mm -hmm. things like how to make a new product or how to assemble something or... Um, things that are knowledge-based, like, you know, how can you unlearn how to tie your shoe once you learn how to tie your shoe, right? And so it's very difficult to try to enforce that. Although, you know, that that's not to say that those aren't put into contracts to try to do that. Yeah. But there, there are certain things that, you know, culturally have not been considered protectable. Um, and it's very difficult okay. to unlearn something once you do learn it. All right, and and so for, for so for contracts, if I have a contract um, with my the contract manufacturer in China, right, and it's in Chinese, I've seen this recommendation over and over again. Just make sure your contract isn't in, in Chinese. Um, have you seen that that's sufficient today, or what's what's your recommendation for companies that are um, that are thinking about you know maybe we should be checking our contracts, right? What what kind of content? Yeah, that, that's a great point. Uh, I think where a lot of Western companies go wrong is that they enter into agreements with Chinese companies using English la language N NDAs or NNNs, yeah. non-disclosure, non-circumvention, non-compete clauses, or other MSAs that aren't really enforceable in China. 
Um, okay. That's not to say that you can't have an English language contract in China or with Chinese vendors that is enforceable. Um, but what I, in my experience, you know, you would need to go ahead and get that contract translated into Chinese and officially, okay. Uh, okay. you know, officially documented. Um, but you're leaving it open to interpretation by the courts by doing that. So in my experience, the best thing to do would be to get the contract in Chinese with English language subtitles there so you can understand it. But Chinese is the official language of the contract that you're entering in, into agreement with. Um, and again, it just make sure it's enforceable because Chinese laws are very different than the United States, very different than Hong Kong in, in many respects, yeah. where a lot of people have familiarity with that. Um, so just make sure that is if you're doing business with in, in China, that the contract is enforceable in China, not using Hong Kong or the United States like Connecticut or Delaware as yeah. some kind of um, dispute body. Right. It's not going to go well. OK, great, great. And then what. So. So. All right. So all that is kind of the background of what's going on and, and what has changed and what hasn't changed. And a lot of businesses now, given. um given risk, right, from what we saw in COVID, from, given this um, pressure for transparency that you can't, uh, you know, not sure how to navigate, um, all these regulatory, everyone's looking at moving now. And what's your take on moving? You know, it, it, and especially here we're talking about electronics and electromechanical products, right, specifically. Um, does it make sense? Should I, as a business owner, if I have electronics and pretty much anybody with electronics has something coming from China, this is where the entire industry has moved. Should I seriously be thinking of moving, even if I have a great factory and I have a great relationship with them? What, what's your take on the, the level of concern people should have um, and the level of attention they should pay for moving from China? Yeah, I, I think it, so it depends on where in the value chain that your product lies. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in many respects. Um, but I, again, I, I would be cautious and, and I would be wary that thinking that you're moving out of China to set up in Mexico or Vietnam or maybe even India or Malaysia, Singapore, that you're somehow de-risking or um, you know mitigating in some respects your exposure to China. Uh, I think well, that why is- that? Yeah, why is, why, yeah. why? I think that, you know, again, China's, you know, dominance in the electronics industry has been known for a long time, right? And mm -hmm. you're talking about every facet of that value chain, uh, especially the production of intermediary goods that goes into the assembly of a lot of finished goods, right? Obviously, we're, we, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, EVs is a big, uh, is, a, mm -hmm. is a hot topic these days, right? The battery industry is dominated by China. I mean, they make 80 to 90% of all the batteries globally, right? And even if you were to set up a factory in Germany or the United States or or elsewhere, you know, you're still dependent on many of the inputs and raw goods and components in those batteries are still coming from China. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, you know, the United States rare earth minerals, we mount we many we mine them in Mountain Pass, California. Well, raw material is shipped to China for processing and it's shipped back because we don't have any processing facilities. So, so again, there's a lot of intermediary components that are made dominated by China. And so even if they're moving to Mexico or Vietnam or, or elsewhere, um, you know, there are many echelons and nodes in that supply chain that are still tethered to China. And so yeah. if there are disruptions in China, though, you know, those factories, those countries will see disruption to their supply chains as well. And in addition, you're adding costs because you're adding more nodes, more echelons into the supply chain from procurement to delivery, right? Um, instead yeah. of going from directly from China, where they're procuring within China, manufacturing it, you know, uh, uh, assembling it, packing and shipping it. Well, now you're getting components shipped to Mexico or Vietnam where they're doing that assembly and packaging and shipping to the United States. So, you know, I would just be wary about about thinking that moving abroad is going to de-risk or, or somehow mitigate your exposure Completely. to China, yeah. especially in the electronics industry. Okay. All right. And I think that brings us to your third tip here. Let me see if I can get it up here. Is 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 don't take China out completely. You're saying there, and there's no reason to necessarily without doing the full analysis, right? Be more be thoughtful about it. 
Yeah, right. certainly. And, and again, when I when I advise my clients, you know, I always look at five key factors, right? I look at, you know, speed. I look at flexibility, dependability, cost, and quality, yeah. right? Those are the key five factors that I look at when, you know, looking at a supply chain and, and, and it's, you know, strengths or it's weaknesses. Um, so, you know, at least try to gain some kind of advantage when you're, when you're searching for another country that yeah. you're looking at, Hey, it might be more speed, flexibility, dependability, cost, quality, are any of these things going to improve compared to my current situation with China? And if the answer is yes, then it's certainly something to consider. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then um, I know that a lot of, and I've been hearing lately that a lot of Chinese factories themselves have been expanding their ownerships through joint ventures or buying factories in other countries. Can you tell us about that? Like what's that strategy and where, what are you seeing there? Yeah, certainly. I think this goes with the value chain. You know, China is moving up the value chain um, in, in many aspects in the mm. electro uh, electronics industry. And those other areas that are lower in the value chain um, are certainly being moved abroad um, to places like Vietnam, Mexico, in some cases, India and elsewhere. Um, and it's Chinese companies that are actually investing in those countries and setting up those factories, either through joint ventures or, or Wolfies, wholly owned foreign enterprises in those countries. Um, mm -hmm. And in many respects, those companies setting up in those countries for, to make those parts are still, in many cases, reliant on China for many of those inputs, right? Their, mm -hmm. their supply yeah. chain is very much tethered to China. So while you see that, you know, you mentioned early or in the um, in the program that Mexico is now the number one trading partner of the United States and it just overtook China, um, what you'll find if you look deeper into the numbers is that China-Mexico trade has increased substantially as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and that a lot China's of those inputs are going Mexico. to Mexico. Yeah, okay. That's right. They're 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 simply a, an intermediary for many of those goods. Not not all cases, but in especially in electronics, in many of those cases, yeah, yeah. you're going to find that a lot of the components and inputs are coming from China, being processed in Mexico and shipped to the United States. Okay. All right. And then let me um, ask you about moving because I do hear a lot of electronics and electromechanical companies considering moving. And my concern is I think they underestimate the complexity of the move, right? And in, in my experience, moves are always uh, take longer than you think and are more complex. So from a, from a China supply perspective, um, what are the things that you would advise to really think about before deciding, yes, we're going to move my supplier, you know, and we're going to initiate this project next month? So... You know, I think China was able to develop into the fact of the world due to a number of factors, right? Friendly investment environment, incredible, efficient, and well-maintained infrastructure that it took them decades to build. Um, you know, things that we take advantage of, like consistent power supply, right? Um, as well as concentration of suppliers and, and manufacturers in special economic zones or in, in certain regions. Um, and again, uh, over the last 30, 40 years, an abundance of low cost and and, and educated labor. Um, and, you know, there are many countries out there that have some sort of form of that, right? But it's very rare that you're going to find all of that in one package deal, right? A lot of countries say, oh, Vietnam's going to be the next China. Vietnam is the size of Guangdong province itself. That's it. And you still have mo many other provinces within China that factories and, and supply chains are, are located in. Um, so no one is ever gonna replace China in that respect, but you can certainly farm off certain aspects of the supply chain and value chain to these other countries. Um, and like I said, coming back to it, you know, you know, look at these five factors, you know, speed, yeah. flexibility, dependability, cost, quality, right? These are the five areas that you should be judging your supply chain and saying, am I getting a comparative advantage by going to this new country and what that is, right? Um, so yeah. before you just you know, decide on the cost. Okay. Let me, all right, let me ask right. you. And I, I certainly... Sorry? Yeah, please. Sorry. No, no, no. Please. Right. So final question, because I want to give some time to questions from the audience um, if we have them. You know, what do you, what, so what's your takeaway for electronics and electromechanical right now, looking into the short term future, the next year or so? 
what are you advising clients? What do you think, what should be their strategy? Should they keep, keep everything there? Are there certain um, types of assemblies they should keep or types of components they should keep, keep or change? What's your, what's your recommendation? Yeah, you know, for better or worse, whether, we, whether the United States likes it or not, China is going to be an integral part of the electronic supply chain for the foreseeable future. Um, that's for sure. And it's going to continue to move up the value chain um, and encroach on many industries that America and Europe, Japan, Korea have dominated for many years. Um, and, you know, again, China has a large and, you know, vertically integrated supply chain and a very large consumer market, which is just as important, right? Many com companies are setting up in China to manufacture and, and make for the Chinese market and to service other markets in the region, right? In Asia and in some cases, Europe. Um, you know, so it's going to be around for a while, um, but I think that there is going to be some decoupling and some de-risking when it comes to, you know, industries that have already been identified, you know, AI, advanced AI chips, advanced semiconductors, right? Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, the United States and Europe are trying to set up their own autonomous, you know, EV um, industries in their in their countries. Um, but again, these these strategies are going to take years, if not decades, to manifest themselves. And so China is going to be around for quite a long time. And I guess the final thing I would mention on this is that, you know, China has an incredibly robust startup ecosystem um, with men, you know, in, in cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, you know, mm -hmm. Nanjing. Um, and, you know, they are incredibly, you know, interlaced with the supply chains there, meaning they can rapidly innovate in the consumer electronics industry. And you're starting to see that, um, yeah. you know, and you're going to see that more and more years to come. Um, so, you know, China's not going anywhere. It's, it's, it's cemented itself. And, you know, in fact, it, it's, it's going to continue to, uh, to grow in the electronics industry. And, and I think you had said that, I mean, this, and this is your final tip, where you, from where you stand today, no reason to really move a finished assembly, right? Finished assemblies you can get quickly, as is, right from China, versus maybe taking advantage of moving something in a sub-assembly if you're doing some in-house manufacturing, right, or component stock, stock. Can you just address that quickly? Yeah, certainly. You know, if you're doing small volumes, low volumes, and we're talking about mm -hmm. maybe 5,000 units under, right? Um, you know, either the single SKU or multiple SKUs, you know, no real reason to leave China right now. You're not going to find, from a cost perspective, you're, it's definitely going to go up if you leave China. Um, mm -hmm. Again, coming back to those five factors, anything under 5,000 units, you're best served staying in China. Um, you know, th uh, there are companies that I consult that do a lot of in-house assembly where you mm -hmm. can get harnesses or wiring harnesses or yeah. other PCBAs that they are then assembling in-house. That might behoove you to look to local suppliers for that. But again, coming back to it, don't think that de-risks you from China um, because a lot of those components are still coming from China, even if they are final assembled in the United States before shipping to you, right? Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, but I think there are some areas that you could look in and saying, hey, listen, I'd rather go local for some of these things. But if you're looking for finished goods that are packaged, assembled, that you can pick, pack, and ship to your customers, I yeah. think China, especially for those kind of volumes, um, are still is still your best bet. All right, right, right. All right, let me let me stop there then and just check in with Eugene, who's doing the facilitation for us today. Gene, any questions in the chat for Andrew before we keep going? I think you're on mute, Gene. Not yet. We don't have any questions from the chat yet, but I do have personally a question. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Andrew, earlier on, you mentioned that uh, Mexico has now become the number one trade partner. How is China reacting to this? What are they doing in terms of um, addressing uh, this loss of business? I think, again, I think it's a natural part of, you know, some of the strategies that, that have been implemented even before Trump. Um, you know, obviously the USMCA, which was formerly NAFTA, right? Increasing some of the uh, input requirements to go ahead and 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 get um, you know reduced tariffs or or taxes on these products, right? Um, so there are a lot of uh, you know companies moving to Mexico. 
But like I noted earlier, if you look at your second, third, fourth, fifth tier suppliers, you're still going to find a lot are concentrated in China, right? So just because you're getting a car part from a factory in Mexico does not mean that the, you know, that it's, it's self-sustained in Mexico. Um, and you're finding a lot of Chinese companies also investing in Mexico, in Vietnam, in India, uh, in, other, in other locales, setting up uh, subsidiaries there. Um, and those supply chains, while they're starting to become, you know, they're starting to build out a little bit, you're still years or decades away before you completely, in, you know, insulate yourself from risks that could happen in China. You know, like they always used to say, if, if the U.S. Um, sneezed, the rest of the world would catch a cold. Um, you, you, can be re you can rest assured that if China sneezes, these countries will catch a cold when it comes to their sure. supply chain. Yeah. Then we also have a question from uh, Li Hongwu, uh, who thanks us for organizing the event, but the, has a question for the first two points that you raised. Are there any specific product categories or space that you see uh, performance from China deteriorating, or is it just US, EU uh, step up in regulatory pressures? Yeah, that's okay. That's a great question, uh, and I'm, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't know specific sectors that have declined like that, Li Hong. But I would say that, you know, obviously, you look at semiconductors. Uh, you know, Taiwan still do dominates for for many of the the high end semiconductors, but China is, you know, again, there's been a lot of stories out there that the regular, you know, that the the restrictions the Biden administration has put in has only accelerated some innovation in that industry. If you look at the Huawei's new Mate 60 phone that came out, uh, a lot of people were very shocked by, you know, how, you know, well that has performed. Um, but, I, you know, I would say that medical supplies, PPE, things of that nature, especially during COVID, you know, it kind of ruined the reputation, right? And made people a little bit more circumspect and, and cautious about sourcing those kinds of products from China, considering that, you know, you had thousands of factories that were making other products all of a sudden within three months are making medical grade masks and other type of PPE. Um, you know, again, that is what has really accelerated a lot of these recent regulations and crackdowns in the U S and Europe. Okay. Hope that answers Andrew, the question. Andrew, let me echo, echo what you're saying in my area, the biomedical engineering, uh, biotech area, a lot of the, uh, noise around issues is related to reagent quality and uh, testing products, not so much uh, uh, PPEs, but really anything related, anything that has active components, there's inconsistencies in quality or it's something around the product life cycle between manufacturing and delivery that creates issues. So it's really the chain of the product in the biomedical field that seems to be one of the issues. Yeah, and to your point, to your to your point, you know, a big concern during during COVID and with the U.S. and Europe was a lot of the uh, the ingredients for a yeah. lot of key drugs still come from China, right? I mean, another one that was just recent yesterday, you know, agreement on fentanyl. Ninety five percent of the components used to make a lot of these drugs, this fentanyl, come from China, right? Absolutely. So again, we're talking further upstream you go, the more concentrated it is in China. Uh, mm -hmm. And where a lot of these companies source a lot of their their components from. Yeah, regardless of the industry. It's amazing. It's amazing. Regardless. All right. So so yeah. I have to cut you guys. Right? This is such an interesting conversation. And and uh, I have I still have a million questions and, and uh, for you, Andrew, uh, that we don't have time to deal with. And I'm sure people uh, in the audience may, too. So I want to uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and your time with us. Um, thanks to the audience for spending time. We um, we will be posting this recording so you can share it. And if your company or you are interested in talking to Andrew about uh, helping your company or getting his advice on anything uh, reviewed today around supply chain and supply chain management, whether it's in electronics and electromechanical or other industries, uh, feel free to reach out directly to Andrew or through us at Suplino, and we can uh, get you an introduction and set you up. And with that, our half an hour has flown by. Thanks again, Andrew. It was a, it was a great talk, always fascinating to pick your brain on these topics. And uh, 
everyone have a great day.